Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to today's event, International Q&A, German Data Protection Laws. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few tools you'll be able to use throughout today's web seminar. To ask a question at any time during the event, please go to the Q&A panel in the lower right corner of your screen, type your question in the box, and then click the Send button. Please keep the default sent to all panelists. Your questions will go to the panelists and will be answered at the end of the presentation as time permits. As a reminder, this presentation is being recorded. I'd now like to turn the conference over to Vin Banj. Vin, please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, this is Vin Banj from Taylor Wessing. Welcome to our webinar today. Today's webinar is part of our monthly webinar program where we bring you our expertise and views on topical data protection issues. Our regular attendees will be very familiar with our previous topics that are broadcast since 2012, and we've looked at issues such as cookies and online behavioral advertising, mobile apps, data transfers, bring your own device, and we've toyed in some, some, some newer areas like wearable technology and privacy. More recently, we've looked at areas such as data security and dealing with breach incidents. We've looked at our data protection index, which was published very, very recently, and last month, we looked at the topic of the data protection regulation to revisit that particular topic and also give some views on where we think we're going with that particular legislative development. Recordings of all those webinars are available if you miss them and if you still wish to engage with us on those topics, they're still available for your reference. Today, we will be taking a different approach to our webinars. This year, we plan to take more of an international view on our topics. So we're starting with that focus today, which is a primer on German data protection laws. For those of you who are new to Taylor Wessing or new to our webinar program, welcome to you. As you will see from the slide in front of you, Taylor Wessing is a leading international law firm. We act for a range of clients in local and international markets, providing a full service law firm offering. And we do that from our office footprint, which spans across Northern, Central, and Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and also across Asia. And we've listed more details about the firm on the slide deck for your reference. Today's webinar is brought to you by Telewessing's International Data Protection Practice. Our team advises on all aspects of data protection and information law, and we do so from our office footprint. And that's a team that's driven globally by 22 partners, and we're also complemented by our international network of data privacy law specialists. So we can be a one-stop shop for your multi-jurisdictional needs as far as data and information law needs are concerned. At Taylor Wessing, we have a microsite which is specifically dedicated to all things data protection, and that's the Global Data Hub. From this site, you will be able to access a variety of things, including news, weekly updates on news and events, and also receive a monthly mail shot. We look at topical issues where we take a regular look at issues that are raising concerns or challenges in the data protection space. You'll also be able to access webinars or register for webinars, see events that are forthcoming, and also see the events that members of the team are attending at different times during the year. You'll also be able to access recordings of webinars, as I mentioned earlier, through the Global Data Hub, where you can use this as a virtual learning bank of webinars to access at your own convenience. Also, you'll be able to access our groundbreaking risk maps, which provide an at-a-glance view of data protection issues with an interactive feature for different countries. You'll also be able to access, as I said, our previous webinars, but also alongside that, the written content that we publish on the specific topics that we've covered. As I said, my name is Vin Banch. I'm head of the UK Data Protection Practice based here at Telewessing in London. I'm delighted to be hosting and chairing the webinar today alongside our special speaker, and that's Sibylla Gershman, who's a data protection specialist from our Munich office. Our respective profile information is on the slide in front of you now for your information. So what are we covering today? And before I hand over to Sibylla, let me just outline what today's agenda will be. So, Sibylla will, in a moment, look at an introduction to German data protection law. We'll explore and outline the concepts and underlying principles of data protection 
in Germany. And then once Sibylla has done that, uh, we are then going to have some Q&A time. We've already had some questions that we've received prior to the webinar, so if you have questions that come to mind during the webinar, please use the usual facility to try and send those questions through to us, and we will do our best to include those within that Q&A time that we have today. Um, if we don't have time to come to your specific questions, apologies, we will try, but if we don't, then we will do our utmost to come back to you individually and answer those questions to you on a one-to-one -one basis. After the Q&A, we're also going to do our usual thing and raise some polling questions for you to consider. So the polling questions will be specific to German law issues and concerns. And if you're new to our polls, then it's important to note that the polling responses that you will be submitting are aggregated. Uh, we're not concerned with the individual who's actually sending the specific responses through. It's more for us to be able to report to you the aggregating vote score. And we'll do that more or less immediately after the poll closes towards the end of this webinar. So we'll be looking in the future at producing some form of compendium of the polling results that we've gathered over the last 18 months or so in the webinar program that we've run. And the views that you give us today and in our forthcoming webinars really are important so we can try and collate these views of our like-minded attendees and, and share with you the views to the specific questions we're raising. To give you an idea of the type of attendees that we have, I appreciate that quite a few people re uh, registered to attend today are new to our webinar program. We have just short of 200 people that have registered for today's session. And at the last count, when I looked at the registration report, we had some 15 different countries represented. So that gives you an idea of the attendee that is attending and registered for today's session. So on that note, let me hand over to our guest speaker today, and I shall hand over to Sibylla. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Vin, for the introduction. I welcome you to our short introduction to, to German data protection law, and within the next 20 minutes, I'll try to present to you where and how German data protection law is regulated and what the, the general underlying princes, principles of German data protection laws are. First of all, when we talk about data protection law, mostly we mean the Federal Data Protection Act, the Bundesdatenschutzgesetz, in short BDSG. Um, this being said, this act only applies in case there is no other law that's more specific. Say, for example, if you work in the telecoms industry, obviously there will be more specific um, regulations on data protection laws in the Telecommunications Act. Same applies, for example, to information society services where we have a telemedia act that applies. Um, finally, what, what's, what's also worthwhile to be mentioned, because that's not always the same in other member states, is that in Germany, the right to privacy is a constitutional right. So we do have federal Supreme Court judgments that are relevant for interpreting the laws. And for example, only a few years ago, uh, the Federal Supreme Court mentioned that the right to privacy includes a right to the integrity of IT systems, meaning that not everyone can access information you have in your IT systems. What is also very specific about Germany is that we have 16 competent data protection authorities. I just sort of outlined the states here on the slide. So what are their competences? Well, first of all, they can always ask um, for information. They can perform audits um, with the company. Um, any filing requirements, they would need to be performed uh, with a competent data protection authority. They're also in charge of data breach notifications. And they have the possibility to issue administrative orders. This order could have a focus um, that you eliminate an infringement or that you see certain proceedings. Obviously, they have also the possibilities of issuing sanctions that can be fines of up to 300,000 euros per incident. We have had occasions where it's summed up, for example, in a case involving Deutsche Bahn, the German railway, 
um, which concerned an infringement of HR data protection laws, uh, we had a fine of 1.1 million. What they can also do, but that in fact rarely happens, is that they can initiate a criminal proceeding. I haven't had that happen in the past, but it's a possibility under the Federal Data Protection Act. As you can imagine, um, the difficulty we have within the EU with the various member states, we already have that in Germany because of the various federal states. And in fact, the, the, the practice of the various DPAs can be quite different. And you could say that there is um, a north-south um, differentiation to be made, meaning that the data protection authorities located in southern Germany tend to be more company friendly, whereas those located in northern Germany tend to be more consumer friendly. Still, what the data protection authority, authorities try to do is to, in a way, harmonize, harmonize their administrative proceedings by having regular meetings. They are called the Düsseldorfer Kreis, which is um, the word, and you find it there on the, on the slides as well. Um, and for that reason, it's quite important when you, when you look into a data protection question to also see whether there has been uh, public opinion of the Düsseldorfer Kreis, because that gives good indication of what the federal data protection authorities are going to do. What are the rules about? Well, we differentiate between formal requirements that are provided for in the Federal Data Protection Act and um, questions of the material or when we apply the law. Formal requirements that we have in the Federal Data Protection Act is that you need to appoint a data protection officer short version is DPO, you need to document all of the processing operations. And in fact, that is something that might be introduced now with the general data protection regulation on an EU level, which is, is um, available in a draft version, as you know, and, and currently discussed between count, EU Council, Parliament, and so forth. Um, you, you have the requirement of prior checking. It's a bit like a data protection impact assessment, where if there are certain risks involved for the data subject, you need to evaluate whether the processing is reasonable and takes account of the rightful interests of the data subject. You have an obligation to, um, to get a written undertaking of your employees towards data, data secrecy, that they keep personal data secret. And you need to have in place written processor agreements. When that's, um, that's for the formal requirements so far. When we apply the law, there are certain general principles that I would say are the red, red lines, so to speak, through the Federal Data Protection Act, and that is the general principle that everything is prohibited unless it's permitted. And that means if you want to collect, process, or use personal data, it needs to be either permitted by law or you need to have the data subject's consent. This is accompanied by the purpose limitation principle, which we all know from the EU directive as well, meaning that already at the time personal data is collected, you need to be very specific for what purposes you're going to use that kind of data. And if you want to later on use it for other purposes, you again would need to, need to have a legal permission or consent. Another issue is the security of processing. You need to have technical and organizational measures in place to ensure that personal data is not um, um, accessed by an authorized person, is not tampered with, and so forth. Personal data that you collect may, collect may not be excessive, meaning that it should be required for the purpose for which you collect it. Unfortunately, there is no, I, I would call it group privilege, meaning that uh, for intra-group data transfers, the same rules apply as to any third party. That could, um, could change if we get the EU general data protection regulation, because EU Parliament, for example, suggested that there be something like an exception for intra-group tra transfers. But for the time being, there is no group, group privilege. Transparency, obviously, is an issue, meaning that you need to inform the data subject um, about the purposes and the kind of data that you collect and use and so forth. And we have the right to access um, data by the data, data subject, to have it rectified if it's uh, false, or to even have it deleted if you don't have uh, a legal grounds for having that kind of data, or um, if the purpose for which you obtained the data no longer exists. 
since the data protection officer is something very specific about Germany, I, um, I'm, I'm having a slide here on, on what the data protection officer is. And uh, I find this important information also because it's a concept that might be implemented now with the EU general data protection regulation as well, um, should, it, should it not be taken out again out of, out of the regulation. What it says is that if you have more than nine people collecting, processing, or using personal data within your company, you need to have a data protection officer. And that person can be an internal or external person. The, what, uh, what format is preferable really depends on your own um, risk evaluation, how large is the company, and so forth. Um, a good reason for taking an external person is that the protection against dismissal is, is much um, stronger in case it's an internal person. He's especially protected, whereas it's more easy to get rid of an external person. On the other hand, it might make sense to have data protection know-how within the company and not outside the company. Um, the person that's qualified for being a data protection officer um, needs, it, it needs to be someone that has the relevant expertise and reliability to perform the job. Expertise meaning that um, he or she is, con is familiar with the data protection laws, has a good understanding of IT and, and, and the business in general. It need not be a lawyer. It can as well be someone in the IT department. It can, however, not be someone that has a conflict of interest. So you should not appoint, uh, for example, someone that is, um, that is leading the IT department because he or she might then have a conflict of interest. The data protection officer reports directly to management. He is free from obstructions, and he should work towards compliance. That's the wording in the act. But he's not a decision maker, meaning that uh, the data protection officer can can point out that there is a data protection risk or that the processing should be changed, but in the end it's up to management to make a decision whether or not they are willing um, to take a certain risk or um, whether they agree that in order to be compliant they would need to change the processing. The data protection officer um, by management needs to be provided with, an adequate, with adequate means to perform the task that could be um, an office obviously, uh, electronic equipment or um, possibly somebody to help with his work if, if, if it's a large company and so forth. They also need to provide him with the documentation of all processing operations because that's really the instrument by which he can check whether the company is data protection compliant or not. And the data protection officer then by law is under a duty to provide an excerpt of that, which can be very ab abstract in fact, in case data subjects want to know what kind of personal data is processed in the company for what purposes. It's also the data protection officer's task to perform prior checks. They're a bit um, like the um, data risk assessments that you have in the general data protection regulation, meaning that the data protection officer would need to be informed in case a new IT process is implemented, and then he would check whether or not um, the rightful interests of the data subject have been taken account of. The data protection officer also is in charge of training personnel. I know that um, this concept of a data protection officer in other member states is viewed quite critically because they find that this might be um, very bureaucratic and a lot of administrative burden. But to be honest, to, 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 um, if, I, if I see the German experience, I really must say that it's quite a good concept because it's a concept of self-regulation, meaning that the company itself is in charge of assessing whether or not they're data protection compliant. They need not register with the data protection authority. Rather, they have an internal register. Um, and and um, unless there is an incident, they really don't have to do with the data protection authorities. So I'm really very much in favor of that concept, in fact. When we come to the application of um, the data protection laws, meaning what is permitted under the data protection laws, as I said, either, either you have consent or you have a legal permission, but there's also some, something in between, which is quite German-specific, and that's the Works Council Agreement. But let me start off with the consent first. The consent as is already 
provided for in the directive needs to be voluntarily vo voluntary informed and under German law in writing. In Germany, the voluntariness can be an issue in an employer-employee relationship because here usually data protection authorities question whether the employee had the opportunity to not provide consent. So usually in an employer-employee co um, context, consent is not the route to go. It would only be a solution in case of voluntary things like um, like stock options, for example, if they are not a large part of the, of the salary. But other than that, if you are um, thinking about HR data, you would need to go the route of works council agreements in general. Um, consent must also, must also be given informed, and here German case law requires quite a great level of detail that I haven't seen in other member states, to be honest. So it really needs to be very specific on the kind of data um, and, and the purposes and the recipients of the data. The form requirement of it being in writing, meaning, meaning a signature, um, can be dealt away with, with if it's unreasonable due to the circumstances. For example, if you're t um, acquiring a consent declaration in an online environment, obviously it could be electronic consent. The Works Council Agreement um, is a good solution in case you have a Works Council. Not all companies do. You need to have, uh, have, have a, a, um, a particular size in order to have a Works Council. And usually Works Councils uh, are awful for companies because um, they can be difficult to negotiate with. But in a data protection consent, they can be a great solution if you want to regulate certain, certain things that the Data Protection Act does not provide for and where consent is not an option. First of all, of course, before you consider a consent or a works council agreement, you would always consider whether there is already a permission provided for by law. The most general permissions I, I listed, uh, listed uh, here on this slide, the first one being obviously you may collect, process, and use personal data if that is required for performance of a contract. Um, the next option is one which in practice is the one most often used, and that is the legitimate interest approach, meaning that you may collect, process, and use personal data if it's required for a legitimate interest of the controller or a third party, and there's no overriding um, rightful interest of the data subject. Obviously, the processing itself must be reasonable. Um, again, this this legitimate interest approach is problematic in an employer-employee employee relationship because here the employer has to take account um, of the, the employee, certain employee rights uh, provided for under labor law. The third option I listed here is publicly available data. It's not often used in practice, um, but could, for example, apply in case you get data from a commercial register, for example, obviously you would not need consent of the data protection subject because it's publicly available data. Another legal permission that's often used is um, in case data is transferred from a controller to a processor. I call it the processor privilege. Um, and it says that um, if, it, if, if data is transferred in a mere controller to processor context and the processor is located within the EU or the EEA, you do not need to have a specific legal permission. It's, it's in fact, it's viewed as if you would transfer the data within the company. So there's no need to obtain consent or, or look for another legal permission. When it comes to international data transfer, first, again, I think there's something that's specific about German data protection laws, and that is that we have a two-step test. So it would not suffice, for example, that you have standard contractual clauses in place on a second, in a second step, you would need to evaluate whether um, you have a legal permission for the transfer at all. Um, let me take you through the two-step test in, um, so that you understand what I mean. Well, first of all, you know that a transfer to countries outside the EU EEA is only permissible if um, you provide for an adequate level of data protection law. And that could either be because there's an adequacy finding of the EU Commission saying that the country that you transfer the data to has an adequate level of data protection law, or it could be because you and the data recipient um, agree on standard contractual clauses, or the data 
recipient is certified under safe harbor or in an intra-group environment, you have implemented binding corporate rules. The, another option, obviously, is ad hoc agreements with approval of the DPA, but that's not very commonly used because it's quite cumbersome to get an approval. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, that's just one part of the exercise. So say um, you have now standard contractor clauses in place, still you would need to consider whether transfer to that third party is permissible. And unfortunately, here in this context, third party is also a mere data processor because the data processor privilege does not apply in this context. And that is the reason why under German data protection laws, we have so many issues with cloud service agreements where the data protection authorities agree that it's a controller to processor operation, but still they say, well, but you need to have, um, you need to have a legal permission to transfer the data to the processor. This is also often an issue in, in, in an intra-group environment where, for example, you um, have cases where, where, where there's a centralized HR database. It would not suffice that, the, say, the mother entity is located in the U.S. The mother entity would be willing to um, sign up to Safe Harbor. In a next step, you would need to evaluate whether the kind of data you are going to provide to the U.S. company is data that they're allowed, allowed to get. When, finally, when it comes to requirements for the data processor, again, I'm just pointing that out, out because it's, it's quite specific on the German law, um, is that um, a processor may only process personal data upon instructions of the controller. What it means is that it doesn't matter what you write on the agreement. If the title of your agreement reads data processing agreement, but the content of the agreement, in fact, is something totally different, then it would not be considered a processor agreement. So really what data protection authorities would be look, looking for is language that ensures that um, the data is only um, processed according to the instructions of the data controller and any language that uh, triggers the idea that the data recipient the, or the data processor is going to use the data for its own business purposes will um, simply um, will, will be interpreted against the agreement being a, a mere processor agreement. By law, the agreement needs to be in writing. So that again means signature on the agreement, which can be difficult, for example, in a cloud computing um, um, context where you might often want people to sign up for those services online. And the agreement by law needs to be specific, for example, about things like kind, scope, and purpose, what data, who are the data subjects. It needs to provide um, rules of correction, deletion, and blocking of personal data. Um, it needs to be exact on subcontractors, uh, whether or not that requires consent of the controller. It needs to be specific about audit rights, instruction rights, and in particular, technical and organizational measures. And in fact, the controller is under duty to audit the implementation of technical and organizational measures before any processing starts. And if the company doesn't do that, it's subject to a fine. You also need to later on at regular intervals check um, again on, on the technical and organizational measures, but um, there the fine is not, um, it, 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 there, there are no hard cut timelines where, where that needs to be performed which is different for the, for the first time auditing that needs to be performed. Yeah, so that brings me to the end of the presentation, which now exactly took me 20 minutes, and I'm looking forward to your questions um, around a German data protection law. Handing over to Vin. Thank you very much, Sibylla. Um, when we um, presented our webinar back in December, we looked at the um, Global IP Index report that we just issued from Taylor Wessing. Now, integral to that is the Data Protection Index. And if you haven't seen that already, I, I would encourage you to, to have a look. What we did is we took uh, a look at a load of statistical data that was gathered from thousands of uh, respondents to our survey across 36 different jurisdictions. And we um, analyzed that with the support of a, um, a specialist company 
that puts together surveys and results. And we um, compiled the Data Protection Index as part of our Global IP Index. And the reason I mention that is that's one of the reasons why we started to take more of an international look in our webinars this year. Through the Data Protection Index, you'll see where the different countries are ranked in terms of how burdensome uh, a, a jurisdiction is seen in terms of data protection, um, or uh, how weak the data protection regime may be, and therefore how friendlier it becomes for organizations uh, to use, collect, and gather information and personal data. And in that data protection index, the um, report found that Germany was seen as the second most challenging jurisdiction as far as data protection laws are concerned. The first, in case you're wondering, was Singapore. And that was particularly placed because the, the Data Protection Act that's just been released and came into force uh, in Singapore that fully comes online in May of this year is a brand new data protection regime, the first regime uh, for Singapore and, and, and very influential for uh, the role that Singapore plays as a regional hub in Asia. Uh, so that's why Singapore was first. But Germany was, was second on that table, and therefore it's perceived to be a jurisdiction that has a data protection regime that is weighted more towards the data subject and perhaps less towards the data controller or organization. Um, and as we expected, we've had quite a few questions in already. We're going to try and take as many of these questions as we can. Um, and I'm going to fire these questions over. They're still coming through in, in no particular order. Um, and, and in some cases, the questions that have been submitted are quite long, and, and uh, I think I may have to abbreviate, so just forgive me as we, as we do that. So the, the first question that comes in is perhaps more of a sector um, question, which is, what are the key issues of German data protection law that impacts on the consumer space? And the consumer space, well, um, I mean, obviously, rules that derive from the regulation 2258, um, meaning the, the cookie regulation and also the direct uh, marketing, um, marketing rules, meaning that you are not supposed to send unsolicited advertising via email or, or, or phone, and that actually is something that's quite big in Germany because we have very strong consumer protection agency, agencies. So that I would um, consider consumer specific. Other than that, I mean, pretty much all of the Data Protection Act also um, relates to any consumer because that's a natural person that can be subject, um, can, can have privacy rights under the, the Federal Data Protection Act. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the next question, and it's something you did mention in your slides, and it's how influential are works councils when it comes to DP compliance? Is it real influence or is it theoretical? It's real influence because because they can block um, they can can block IT implementation. If um, they can they can block consent declarations. In fact, um, under uh, labor law, there is a rule that as soon as the employer implements technical equipment that is likely to be able to monitor um, compliance or behavior of employees, the Works Council needs to co-determine. And, and for that reason, we have so many Works Council agreements, for example, on the use of Internet and email and monitoring um, Internet and email of employees. Excellent. So very certainly a, a real uh, influence and not just a theoretical one. Okay. Um, the, the next question, again, I, I know you mentioned this, but I'll ask it mainly because I can't remember the figure either. But in relation to fines and enforcement, what is the current maximum fine or penalty for a breach of the German data protection law? Well, it's still the 300,000 euros I mentioned, but it's per incident, so it can sum up. Um, the highest fines we have seen, I think, was uh, 1.5 million and, and that was uh, video surveillance of employees 
and the other one was the 1.1 million I mentioned for Deutsche Bahn, which also consider, concerned employee data. So those are two examples for larger fines. Usually the fines are much lower, and in a, in a normal environment, um, a data protection authority, before issuing a fine, um, provides the, the, the company with an opportunity to um, to respond to to the request that they have and to cooperate with the data protection authority, and then you might even be able to send off the fine. Okay, thank you. Um, a, a slightly um, higher level question that's come in here, which is in relation to data transfers, uh, and what is the impact of the Snowden and WikiLeaks revelations on data transfers from a German perspective? It, it is a political impact, first of all. Um, people are very upset about it. But this being said, also the data protection authorities are upset. So in summer last year, they issued a pre they, they made a press release um, saying that uh, now with the information they obtained from, from the prison scandal and the Snowden revelations, they would consider whether safe harbor and standard contractual clauses are complied with. And so they, in a, in a way, they, it, it was just a threat, and for the time being, nothing has happened. But it's just that they want to caution everyone to consider uh, whether or not they really want to transfer data to the United States, considering that there might be unauthorized third-party access. Okay. Um, a, a, a rather cryptic question, but is anything really possible without consent? Next question. Oh, absolutely. Most, I would say um, most of the data processing we have is without consent. And that's because we have uh, the contract performance uh, rule and also the legitimate interest approach, which is, I would, I would well, first of all, I would say about 80% of the processing can be performed without consent. And uh, among the 80%, uh, it, it may be something like 50-50 between contractual performance and the remainder being a legitimate interest approach. Okay. Um, a question about the regulators here. Uh, what are the current hot topics and priorities for the German data regulators? Well, it, it certainly is... Um, it, it certainly is tra transfers to, data transfers to the U.S. Um, and here, um, when I um, just a while ago talked to one of the data protection authorities in, in North Rhine-Westphalia, for example, they said, well, they would be looking in particular for the service providers and would be looking into their concepts um, of standard contractual clauses, for example, whereas they would not so much be interested in intra-group transfers because those they would find less critical. Um, but those international da data transfers are certainly an issue. Um, cloud services are a huge issue, in particular when it concerns sensitive data like health data um, or data that is subject to professional secrecy like uh, attorney-client data and so forth. Um, other than that, it's, it's lots, lots of Internet aspects. Um, data collected by apps without um, without the required information, uh, that, that kind of thing. Okay. And a question uh, from me, uh, the exercise chair's prerogative, and ask you a question that really relates to that as well. And one theme that we're seeing increasingly, certainly here from the UK, amongst UK uh, data protection matters, and also the more international data protection projects that we see through the London office. Um, many of which you support us with, Sibylla. Um, does the German regulators, or do the German regulators um, also um, take a view or have any specific areas of concern on the topics of big data uh, and RFID? Oh, absolutely. They've issued quite a few statements on that, and, and big data seems to be a topic of nearly every conference, so to speak. Um, and I think, to me, that really is one of the hot, hot topics of the future, because with big data, obviously, there are so many good purposes for which you might want to use um, 
big data. And then again, you have the downside of possibly there being an infringement of privacy rights. Um, and that is also a hot topic in negotiations in the EU Council for the General Data Protection Regulation, where, um, where the companies say, well, you need to give us some legal permission when it comes to, for example, statistical data or when it comes to online behavioral advertising. And we are seeing that this has been taken up um, by European Parliament, for example, but also by the European Council. And it will be interesting to see what the outcome of the, that negotiation is, should we ever get a European data protection regulation. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, and I, I, again, there are areas that I, I see, I absolutely agree with you, I, I think they're going to continue to be topical. Um, and um, we plan to look at the topic of uh, big data, so I'll let, get, get the plug in for that now uh, on one of our webinars later in this, uh, in this series, probably just before summer, so we're hopefully going to get it in in Q2 this year, uh, on, on specifically on the topic of, of big data. So another question that's come in, in fact, we've got several. I'm going to keep going. There's loads of questions here, Isabella. Um, so the next question we have here is, what is the literal German equivalent or translation of the term subject access request? Subject access request? Yes. Um, I guess that means data subject access request, which is Auskunft. Um, the, the data subject can request uh, information on what kind of data is stored with a company. And um, uh, uh, I'm going to follow up on that. In terms of the time frames and the, the protocols around it, so um, in the UK we uh, were able to charge by statute a maximum fee of £10 sterling. Uh, we have 40 calendar days in which to respond. Um, although ultimately we need to respond promptly when you have a subject access request. Are, are there similar time frames and fees set out by statute? No, not really. I mean, it should be without undue delay, but there are no fixed time frames and there should be no fee charge for it because it's, it's a right of the data subject. Okay. That's, that's only different with regards to, for example, credit scoring agencies. Um, they have an exemption there you can get and the information, I think, once per year for free, and if you need further information, you need to pay a fee. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So I have a question uh, which is as follows. Um, is it the case that a customer can view the BDSG data processing agreement uh, and or the model clause agreement that we have in place with our processor and affiliates? Uh, or can we not just state that we, that we have it in place? So do we have to show customers that agreement or, or, or can we simply say we have it in place and is that enough? For the German um, processor agreement, there's no need to show it to the, data protect, uh, to the data subject. Concerning the standard contractual clauses, I think there is a provision saying that you, some parts of it need to be accessible for the data subject. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, um, Commercial details would not be um, needed to, to provide to the data subject. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> the next question I have here is in relation to data protection officers. Um, does the DPO need to be based in Germany? Can you ask a third party, e.g. an external legal counsel, to be the DPO? Uh, this is a genuine question and not a plug from me for Taylor Wessing. <laughs> well, um, yes, the, the person needs to be located in Germany. That's the view of the data protection authorities because they find that otherwise he or she could not perform his or her task. It could be, um, it could be a law firm, yes. This is sometimes, yeah, no, could be a law firm. Could be a law firm. Okay, excellent. Um, so I'm planning to the questions here. Uh, a question on BCR. Please could you provide more information on BCR? Would an intra-group transfer agreement under the EU model clauses not suffice? I'm assuming that means as, as the fundamentals for a BCR. Right. I mean, that's 
then what, what what we too call the BTR light, right? That you sort of use the yeah. standard contractual clauses and have a network or rather a framework agreement uh, with standard contractual clauses. That can be a solution. Um, there are some authorities in, in Germany that we would require that this is filed with them or discussed with them. But in, in general, that, that is a possibility, yes. And, okay. um, and binding corporate rules, I think everybody knows what they are, right? So we don't need to... Uh, yes, that's right. So, uh, And we have actually discussed binding corporate rules in, in, in much more detail in one of our previous uh, webinars uh, as well. But I, right. I've certainly seen the same attitude from other regulators across Europe where they would um, be sympathetic towards uh, a form of intra-group transfer agreement as being the bedrock for a binding corporate rule solution. Um, if that's what you need to actually provide for the, the binding element amongst the group. So it, it is possible. You, you don't always have to base it on a policy that is binding. It could be based, you could use the intergroup structure to actually provide for that binding element as well. Okay, next question. If you process data of German data subjects, but are based in the UK, do the rules for the nine employees using the data mean you have to have a DPO, even if you're no. based in the UK? No, no, definitely not. Because that's okay. an administrative rule that only applies to German companies. Okay, so it's only the German companies uh, that are employing, that have nine employees uh, in Germany or as part of the German establishment. Is that well, right? The, 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 no, the employees could be elsewhere. It just needs um, the, da the data controller needs to be located in Germany and employ uh, nine persons. Uh, where those persons are located is of no relevance in general. Okay. Um, so just plowing through. Is click and accept not allowed under German law? Um, if it includes personal information. So I'm assuming that means a click and accept mechanism perhaps on a website. Oh yes, I mean I mean if yeah, if if it's an active click and not a pre checked box, then that could constitute con consent. It would need to be protocoled for proof later on. But that's possible. Okay, excellent. Um, moving on To what extent are companies obliged to audit the tons of processes as you mentioned earlier on? Well, that's a very good question because the law is not very specific about the level of diligence that you need to apply to, to such an audit. Um, the most important audit certainly is the one before the processing starts because, as I said, that one is subject to a fine and uh, you're under duty to document that have, you have performed such an audit. This being said, um, the audit, depending on, on, the, de depending on the, the processor, how, how reliable is the processor, depending on the size of company, depending on the, the risks involved for data subjects, um, the audit can be quite minimal. It could be something like a questionnaire um, where the processor answers, yes, I have that in place, yes, I have that in place, um, but you need to have some way to document it. Um, then again, if it's a more riskier um, data processing, the data protection authorities, by way of example, mention call centers. Um, there they would require that, because there has been so much misuse of personal data in call centers, that they would require that you um, um, audit uh, on site and, and, and see what's happening there and whether they implement the technical and organizational measures provided in the agreement. Excellent. Thanks for that answer. Um, another question that's linked to Safe Harbor, and that's given that you don't need DPA approval for Safe Harbor transfers, what is the actual impact on companies still using Safe Harbor? For the time being, I would say none. Um, obviously, there is the press release I mentioned uh, uh, from, from the summer where they said that um, uh, safe harbor might not be complied with if there has been unauthorized access by uh, by U.S. government authorities. 
Um, this being said, I don't really see a case where um, the data protection authorities would be in a position to prove that. So I would say um, everything is business as usual there for the time being. Excellent. Okay. Um, and still on the topic of data transfers, another question that's coming here is, are there signs that German DPAs will take a reasonable and supportive approach to companies seeking VCRs? Oh, absolutely. They are um, very much in favor of binding corporate rules. In particular, the Bavarian Data Protection Authority has taken on quite a few sets of binding corporate rules right now, and is the lead authority for them. Um, so if any company is considering binding corporate rules, I think now is a good time to implement that uh, because there's a lot of support from the Data Protection Authority. Excellent. That sounds quite positive in that respect. Um, a question here, which is, where do common DP controls, such as data loss prevention tools or email monitoring and web filtering, where do they fit under German law? Are those considered to be legitimate interests? Um, in a way, yes. I mean, for employee data, um, the legitimate interest approach is applied only very reluctantly. So in implementing those measures, you need to take very careful considerations of the rights and freedoms of the employees, um, which I said, if you have a works council, um, it's always useful um, to, to have transparent rules in a works council agreement. Um, and also, in, in that context, you, you need a works council agreement anyway, because there's a right to co-determinate by, by the works council. Okay. Yeah. And as you mentioned in Works Councils, another question that relates to that is, can you please expand on the nature and content of Works Council agreements, or as much as you can expand in the time that we've got left? <laughs> well, usually it's a, it's a document that explains the scope of the document, and uh, for example, could be email and internet use, or use of IT equipment, and then it explains the, to, to what kind of employees it applies, and um, the, the, the rules um, under which the personal data is processed, and it, it's very specific about the purposes. Um, and if it's, for example, an agreement about the monitoring rights, it needs to be very explicit on what kind of mon monitoring, for what purposes, what escalation procedures there are, uh, whether or not the data protection um, officer, for example, needs to be present in case employee data, uh, data are checked and so forth. So that's the kind of content one w would expect in a Works Council agreement. Okay. okay. Um, I'm probably going to just allow one more question because then we need to move to the polling questions. Um, and that's regarding the use of sub-processors that are located outside the EU or the European Economic Area uh, of a data processor located within the EU. Some states is required to set up a direct contract between a data controller and a sub-processor. Uh, what is the legal basis for it, uh, either under the federal DPA or any other law? I'm assuming that's German law. Yes, right. Well, the legal basis for that really is a recital in the standard contractual clauses 2010-86, where it says that these standard contractual clauses only apply to a controller-to-processor relationship. Um, and uh, do not apply to processors um, located in the EU. And from that, um, I think not only German DPAs, I think also other member states um, take it that the, it's not possible to um, close uh, standard contractual rules, uh, to agree on standard contractual rules with a European data processor who then onward transfers the data to his subcontractors. This being said, the solution can be quite simple. Um, I mean, one solution would be to possibly authorize your European data processor to sign, sign up standard contractual clauses on behalf of the data controller. Okay. And, and to my knowledge, as you, you, you mentioned at the beginning of your answer, um, there is also further clarification in the um, Article 29 Working Party, which issued an FAQ document following exactly. the release of the 2010 clause, which also states the same position as that. Um, I'm just going to take one point of clarification, actually, if I may, and it, it's come in uh, following one of the earlier questions I asked. The question I asked 
earlier on, Sabella, is, uh, is it the case that a customer can view the BDSG data processing agreement and other model clauses that you have in place for the processor or an affiliate? And can we just state that we actually have it in place without showing it to them? Uh, that question, when it referred to a customer, it actually meant a business customer and not a consumer. So we talked in your answer to that question as about consumers uh, as data subjects having rights to, to see those agreements depending on which set of model clauses you're using. Does, does the position differ if it's a business customer that we're talking about? Well, only if the business customer is a data controller and wants to know whether you as a data processor um, have, a right, have correct agreements in place with your subcontractor. That would be the only possible scenario, and, and other than that, it would not be a data protection question. It's, it's more a civil law question whether or not you want to show your contracts to your, your business partner. Um, but really, the only right to review this kind of agreement is if um, the, the controller with its processor says, well, you may engage subcontractors, but you need to ensure that those, those subcontractors have similar provisions in place and I'm allowed to review them. In this case, yes, you would need to present then the clauses. But it's, it's pretty much up to the contractual language that you use. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much for that clarification. Thank you for taking all those questions. There's uh, slightly more than even we anticipated here. There are some more questions, uh, quite a few more actually. And as I said at the beginning, I didn't think we'd get to them all. Uh, we've got to as many as we can and I've still got a few minutes I need to take up with the polling question. So those questions that we haven't managed to get to, we will do our best to try and reach out to you individually and, and give you our views uh, on the questions that you have raised. So I will, as I promised, um, just move on to the polling questions. So as always, we'd like to ask you the question, the polls are now already open. And the question, three questions which we have for you, one is, have you already found the right de data export solution for Germany? So uh, in terms of your current solutions, um, have you already found the right data export solution for Germany? And if so, is it A, BCR? Is it B, a data transfer agreement based on standard contractual clauses? Uh, is it C, US Safe Harbor? Uh, or is it D, is it something different? Is it something, for example, like consent or legitimate interest ground that you've relied on. Second question is, um, if you haven't found a solution yet, do you still consider US Safe Harbor as a potential solution for you? Uh, and that, I guess, is something for you to bear in mind, given what we've discussed today and the questions that we've had in. So A, yes, you would still consider using Safe Harbor. B, you would delay using Safe Harbor until there's greater, greater clarity on its future, or C, no, you would use another solution. And the last question is, more around commercial considerations of the German data protection regime. Based on my comments that I've made uh, and those that we explored in more detail on the uh, data protection index that we've produced, uh, and also given what you've heard today and your own knowledge of other jurisdictions. So, what are your commercial considerations of the German regime for data protection? Is it A, enough for you to consider, for example, not launching in Germany? Is it B, does it make you think of other EU jurisdictions before you would launch in Germany? Or C, would it make no difference at all to your plans as far as Germany is concerned uh, amongst your plans for Europe? So please do click away if you haven't clicked already, and I'll come back to you uh, on those results in just a moment. And whilst we're just waiting for those polling results to be combined, combined um, let me just say our next webinar is scheduled for the 18th of March. We're going to be looking very specifically at the topic of CCTV, closed circuit television, and monitoring in the workplace, an area which uh, is certainly one that's regulated um, and causes many uh, areas of excitement across data protection regulators across Europe. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at that subject, and that will be presented uh, in the main by my colleagues, Sally Anaro, who is a senior member of the data protection team based here in London, 
and also another member of our data protection team, Amy Sinclair, who is a, an employment or labor lawyer, but who has a specialist focus also on data protection. So that's our next webinar on the 18th of March. So let me look over at the questions and give you the polls that have come back. So the first question um, was about uh, whether or not you've already found the right solution um, and what the solution is. Uh, only 4% of you said the solution is BCR, binding corporate rules. Uh, a massive 48% of you said it was solution based on the data transfer agreement. And then the numbers come down and are evenly split. 20% have said it's safe harbor and 20% have said it's based on something different. So overwhelmingly, data transfer agreement seems to be the basis of solution uh, that uh, our attendees have at the moment. Looking at question two, so looking forward, if you haven't found the right solution, uh, what do you have in place? 44% um, of you said you would still consider US Safe Harbor um, as your solution. And given what we've heard today, um, none of you would consider delay use consider a delay in using safe harbor. So that's clearly not put you off uh, at all. And then 32% of you uh, said no, you wouldn't use a safe harbor and you would look to use a different type of solution. Uh, so some interesting views there in terms of the uncertainty that we've heard about uh, in so much commentary around safe harbor. The third question, just to wrap up here, uh, was all around commercial considerations of the German regime. Um, only 8% of you thought uh, there is enough here to, to put you off launching in Germany or make you think of other jurisdictions in Germany. Uh, a vast majority, uh, almost 80% of you, thought actually, based on what you've heard, it would make no difference at all to your plans. So that's very encouraging to hear, and hopefully what you've heard uh, that's helped you support the answer there is, is by and large based on the um, excellent presentation that we've heard today from my colleague Sibylla Gershman. So Sibylla, thank you very much for joining us in our presentation and in our webinar today. For our attendees, thank you very much for the questions that you sent in. It's great, as I mentioned earlier on, to see such a wide-ranging number of countries represented by our attendees today, over 15 different countries represented. We thank you for joining our webinar today. We look forward to seeing you at future webinars, and in particular the next one on the 18th of March. So from the team here at Taylor West Inc., both in London and in Munich, thank you very much and have a good day.